Today on the Photo Apps Podcast, we explore one app that has captured the heart of many pro photographers. Capture One Pro. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of The Apps Show, our podcast all about the great photography apps that are out there. Today, I am with David Grover, the business support and development manager. Got to get that whole title in there from Capture One. <laughs> <That's a big laughs> one. <laughs> David, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's wonderful to have you here. Capture One is uh, uh, obviously a very big product. This is uh, something that's yes. been around for a long time. And uh, we clearly are not going to get into a demo of everything that it does. But today we want to talk about what the app is, who it's for, who should be considering it. And especially since the demise of Aperture a number of years ago, a lot of people are still Absolutely. trying to figure out where to go. And I know that Capture One's a, an excellent choice for a lot of people. And so we're going to we're gonna get into all that in the demo today. Before we do, before we get into the nitty gritty, let's just hear a little bit about you and your history with okay. the company. How long have you been with uh, with FaZe? It's the, the, the mother company is FaZe. Yeah, the mother company is Phase One, that obviously creates uh, or manufactures uh, our cameras, uh, but also um, with a, the the sole producer, if you like, of uh, Capture One as well. So I've been with uh, Phase One since uh, 2012 now, uh, purely in the in the software department. So there's a team of around probably 10 of us now who uh, basically it's, it's our responsibility to sort of bring Capture One to the world as, it, as such with sales and marketing, um, education, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Very good. Very good. And you're based in the UK, I think, right? Yeah, I'm based in the UK, but um, I go back and forth to Denmark quite a lot. I actually travel to the, the USA a fair amount as well, uh, supporting the partners, doing events and exhibitions and that sort of stuff. And I create all the online tutorials. I do weekly webinars on Capture One as well. So it's kind of anything and everything to do with the sort of education of Capture One and, and uh, marketing of it and publicizing it as well. So everyone gets to know about it. Great. Now, just from a very high level overview, since just anybody who's watching this or listening who isn't mm -hmm. familiar with the software at all, what sure. is in the kind of an elevator pitch? What is Capture One? <laughs> Capture One is primarily a raw converter, so it's there to take the, the raw file from your camera and then produce your final output. And of course, that's with a variety of uh, tools and adjustments and workflow aids and so on. Uh, it's also an asset manager, so you can manage your assets in a catalog, very similar to, of course, what uh, Lightroom did um, and what Aperture did, for example. You can do uh, the, the same thing within Capture One as well. So asset manager and raw converter and I guess additional to that which uh, uh, Capture One is I guess the most known for or one of the most known for is to tether up your camera sure. and shoot directly into it you know uh, with your Canon, Nikon, Sony uh, or Phase One camera and shoot directly uh, into into uh, Capture One. Right which if mm. for the viewers out there if you've never shot tethered it really is a, a fun experience to do mm. obviously you're you're tethered, physically connected to a computer. Yep. <laughs> but if you're in a studio environment, uh, it can be a really nice way to shoot and get the image up on a big screen right away. And it doesn't have to be your laptop. You can tether to a big 5K yeah, iMac and have anything. this huge display of your image moments after you shot it. It's it's a fun way to work. It really is cool yeah. to do it that way. And and it's also about the collaboration aspect right. as well, because if, if you're shooting, just looking at your LCD, then really only you can see it and you can't really have a huddle of you know, six people uh, around it, like the stylist and the client and so on. But if you're working off a computer of some description, A, it's a lot easier for everyone to see, and B, you can really visualize the final result with adjustments in Capture One uh, so the client gets a better idea of how it's going to look as opposed to looking at, you know, the camera's part processed right. preview on the back of the camera. So, so yes, it's convenient that you can see on the big display, but it's also great that you can collaborate in that atmosphere too. Absolutely. And I know one of the cool yeah. things that I remember discovering when I was playing with the tethering is that you can develop a, a look, a process look for an image and then have it automatically applied to the image when you shoot it in tethered so that it comes up Absolutely. with that process, that black and white, that high saturate, whatever it is you've developed, you can see that right yep. away, which is really cool. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. And I think it's worth pointing out because we've just talked about all these things that you can do in a studio environment with clients looking over your shoulder and so on. That's not to say mm -hmm. that this app is only for people who work in big studio environments with big, huge budgets and clients and stylists and colorists all looking over the shoulder. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody can use this. 
Yeah, anyone can use uh, Capture One. It, it was born in the studio because Capture One was written for Phase One cameras, um, you know, 20 years ago or whatever. That's how okay. old Phase One is now when there was no, you know, software around. So it was born in the studio. But since then, it's evolved very much into an application that if you never shot tethered, doesn't matter. Okay. You know, it doesn't have to be a, a tethered application, uh, as you say. If you just want to use it for your location work, that's fine too. Um, you know, anything, then of course it, it's it's perfectly uh, applicable for Certainly. that. Certainly. And what is the price? Mm. The price is uh, for a brand new standalone license as such. Uh, then it's two hundred ninety nine US dollars or two hundred ninety nine euros. If you already own Capture One uh, eight or nine, so earlier versions, then you can upgrade for $99. Okay. Uh, if you don't want to buy a license outright, you can subscribe as well, but you get the choice. And that price varies depending whether it's a three month subscription uh, or a 12 month subscription and, and so on. And you can find out all the various different sub levels if you just uh, go onto uh, the website. Okay. Um, each license is probably important to, to point out. If you buy a license outright, that gives you three installs. So if you've okay. got your studio machine, your home machine, your spare laptop in the living room or, or whatever, then you get three installs, Mac or, or PC. Uh, subscriptions are two installs. If you need more than that, you can buy five-seat license, 10-seat license, 15-seat license, and so on okay. if you wish. Great. And so then the advantage of subscription over the buying the license outright would be that you keep paying the same per month or whatever it is and as there's updates you're going to get them you don't have to pay yeah you get automatic um uh what's the word automatic sort of access to all the new updates right. uh if you have a license outright you still get uh the updates to you know all the current version right. 10 for example if we have a 10.1 or a 10.2 you right. get that and then if an 11 comes along then you would pay your upgrade but on the subscription you would just automatically get that as part of sure. your subscription okay so it's it's a financial thing really do you want to pay monthly or do you want to pay a license outright right. at Fair the end enough. of the day the financial cost is probably relatively similar it just depends how you want to divide up your finances i guess makes sense and then you mentioned yep. that it's mac and windows this runs on both platforms Yes. So on Mac, you've got to be on Sierra. So the latest operating system or the previous, which is El yes. Capitan, correct? Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yep. Uh, and then Windows, it's seven and above. So okay. seven, eight, there was no nine. Uh, and ten. <laughs> yeah. Wherever that went. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. All right. Well, good. Yeah. We got the basics out of the way. I think it's time to jump in and start taking a look at, uh, at the software and see what it looks like. You ready to give us okay. a tour? Yeah, definitely. So shall we start with, um, let's just start with kind of basic interface, if you like, because yeah. I think it's uh, it's important to sort of mention that Capture One, the interface, obviously, we have a, a default workspace, if you like, but all of that can be changed. Okay. Uh, and the second thing that to, to point out is that it's not modular in, in any way. So there's no library module, there's no develop module as per Lightroom. If you want to process at any point, then you can just hit a shortcut and go for it. So you don't have to switch between, you know, if you like those various different modules to, to access different parts of the software. Everything is available at uh, any one time, okay. which is great. That is great. And that's something, huh. obviously I have the, my history, my background is in Aperture. And these days mm -hmm. I'm using, mostly using Lightroom. And that is one of the most frustrating things for me to have to keep jumping back and forth between these modules or modes or rooms or whatever they call them. Um, yeah. I really do miss that. Uh, so that's good to see that that works that way inside of Capture One. I think that's fantastic. Yeah, and we can we can sort of break the software down into to four different elements, I guess. We have the, the toolbar sort of sitting along the top, which has these various action buttons that, that do something when you press them. Uh, so undo buttons, trash buttons, import, for example. So any of these that you hit will turn on some kind of action like exposure warning that I've just turned on there. Mm -hmm. uh, in the center, we refer to the viewer, which is obviously where you can uh, see your image, um, at various uh, degrees of zoom. On the right hand side, we have the browser, which has all our various different thumbnails. And on the left hand side, we have the tools, which are divided up into various different tool tabs, which contain different tools for uh, different tasks. The first one being, if you like, the, the library tool, sort of organizational tool, and then various different tool tabs as you go through that. But all of that can be changed. 
So if, for example, you would rather have your tools on the right hand side, if you're coming from a Lightroom perspective as such, then under the view menu, we have all kinds of different um, options for customization. So if we look down here, we can see place tools right. So mm. if we just say that, then it flips it over like so. So if you're you know, used to uh, navigating sure. to the right with uh, your mouse, your muscle memory always wants you to go to the right if you've been using Lightroom, uh, then it's, it's very simple to do so. Okay, very good. And can you put the thumbnails on the bottom as well? Yeah, if we want thumbnails on the bottom, we could say place browser below like so, and then various different styles of looking at the browser and all these dividers are dynamic in, in size as well. So you can pretty much shape it uh, however you wish. And also that continues with the tool area where the contents of each tool tab can also be changed. So if I want to change the order that tools sit in, I can do so. If I want to add a particular tool, I can just right click on the tool tab and then pick it up, for example, move that to where I want. Uh, you may wonder why on earth would you have two tools that do the same thing. Um, <laughs> but first, let's just get rid of that one because that one doesn't make sense. But for example, with the curve tool, we could actually have two different curves tools. Mm. So let's grab another one because the curve tool we can run in different modes like an RGB mode or a luminosity mode so sometimes it's nice to be able to see uh, both at so the same would time. that be two views of the same curve or is this two separate instances of curves being applied two views so if I just throw in a really bad RGB curve there and just pick up RGB okay. then we can see it's the same okay. so it's actually manipulating in the same way but if I wanted to play with RGB and then like individual channels sure. or have the option of always being able to do uh, an RGB curve or perhaps a luminosity curve then I could could do so as well for example okay great so question for you then since you can rearrange mm -hmm. the tools what yep. order is the image processed in what doesn't matter really it doesn't matter so, so okay because I know yeah if you looked at Aperture, for example, you could, mm -hmm. it was processed top to bottom and you knew that this happened before this, this happened before this. Right. right? right. And if you look at something like um, Luminar from Mac Fun, you can rearrange the modules mm -hmm. just like here. But if you rearrange them, that changes the order of processing because it gets processed oh, really? top down. Interesting. Yeah. So it would go through curves and then through exposure. But if you reverse them, then it goes through exposure and then curves. And so what's, when the order can be changed randomly and it's not affecting the output of the image, Yep. Is there any guidance on what order the image is processed in or where you as the user should start? It's better to start with exposure and then go to curves or the other way around. Or is it completely irrelevant because if you were to add some, do something mm -hmm. in exposure and then do the exact opposite in another tool, would it be a net zero and the image would have zero difference from where it started? Yes. So just to answer that last question quickly, yes, that would be a net zero if I did plus five on exposure and then i did say a local adjustment you know just on part of an area which was minus five okay. then that net would be would be zero as such but in terms of what should you do first let me just get back to my normal workspace by the way you can save your workspaces so that you can uh, always return to you know your expected mm -hmm. uh, workspace and of course we can hide the various elements with keyboard shortcuts sure. like command b uh, to hide the browser and so on. So really, there is no hard and fast rule about what to do first. Um, but you can safely assume that trying to, like if we just pick a different uh, location of images, uh, let's say something like this, which is obviously underexposed and the white balance is off, I wouldn't start trying to you know, play with color or anything like that. The very first thing I do would probably be to fix the exposure, get a decent white balance, fix the levels kind of thing. And then I would go on to thinking about other stuff like, do I want to change the contrast? Do I want to play with the colors and all that sort of stuff? So so it doesn't make sense to, to try and do those things without getting a good base point of sure. like exposure, white balance, and then you're good to go. But other than that, you can do it in any kind of order that you like. It makes no difference to the okay. final quality output or integrity of the file. Okay, great. Good to know. Yeah, good, good. So, uh, yeah, to finish off on the interface, um, I mean, this is how I like to work, but um, you'll see under workspace that we've got some 
ones that you can try. There is actually one called Migration, which uh, sneakily puts everything on the right hand side and arranges it more in a Lightroom esque sort of kind of way. <laughs> but of course, it's not, you can not change migration all that. from what? It's just migration. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just but just generic migration. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and then of course you can save your workspaces as you saw sure. and go back and happily sort of move around as you wish. But I agree, it's nice that you're not restricted to anyone else's workspace because we have this argument every time a new capture one comes out or a revision uh, we think well let's change the default workspace because it could do with an update and so on so we all submit our workspace and say mine is the best workspace and you end up with 10 totally different workspaces right, which proves there is no perfect workspace right. everyone is a little bit different so what we've done are just suggestions so go ahead and make something that makes sense to you fair enough now, one of the things yeah. that i've always felt about the capture interface is very high contrast mm -hmm. the background is so black yep. and the the text obviously almost pure white or or maybe it is and then uh, and it's quite small, especially on a high DPI mm. screen. It seems like it can be quite small and hard to read. How much of this can you change? Uh, in terms of like the, the uh, you know, mean and moody background, I guess. <laughs> uh, if we go to, is it appearance? Yeah, so viewer, we've got black, uh, very dark, uh, dark and so on. We can go all the way up to white. Okay, so so that's I know just quite behind a few my... the image, but not behind the tool. Yeah, behind the image. Some people actually prefer to work off white because they feel that it gives you a better judgment of exposure. Um, that's interesting. Like, again, that's person, personal preference. Yeah, I think preference. middle gray would give I... you a better, better judgment of exposure. Yeah, so I don't know. Again, it's personal sure. preference. I tend to stick relatively with the default. So you can change that. There's all kinds of other stuff you can change about uh, the colors and how things are indicated. Mm -hmm. But in terms of uh, tool size and text size, generally that can't be changed. But tools which make sense to have a bigger interface like the color editor, which we get into, we can actually scale sure. some tools so that they get bigger and if if you're working off a dual monitor space then of course you can tuck this to your mm -hmm. secondary monitor and work on that just fine so some tools can be scaled like the color editor and also like the uh, color balance tool is another mm -hmm. scalable tool like so as well okay. but generally no i think with with 4k monitors you need pretty good eyesight that's for sure for yeah a lot of uh, applications yeah i would say that's um I file that one under a future request from someone who's used it just a little bit i'm i'm certainly no yeah uh, no, no pro i on agree it, but, i agree yeah and yeah. i run my my laptop at the maximum resolution so it's a retina 15 inch retina screen but i don't run it at the default right. everything's just too big for there and i run it at the max which is equivalent of a 1920 wide screen in yes. non-retina and then it's uh, so it's 4k wide and then it's it's okay it, wow it can be hard to see some of those things <laughs> yeah <laughs> so yeah getting getting the ability to increase the font size on there would be um that would be would very be nice, nice. I, I say. yeah that would be very nice to have yeah no. all right yep. cool so I, I agree enough uh, enough about the ui and let's see how this thing works yeah absolutely so obviously as you said at the start we can't go into you know, every single facet of, of CaptureOn because we'd be here, you know, uh, a, a few hours or, t or two or three days as such. But um, if we pick out a couple of things that are sort of unique, I think to Capture One will probably make sense. And generally what pops up when discussing with people, and I'm going to open this weird looking image here for a second, is uh, the way we handle uh, color, if you like, or mm -hmm. the adjustment of color. Um, and uh, local adjustments, again, is something that's, that's very strong as well. But let's have a look at color, because that kind of gives you Great. a good ethos into uh, Capture One and how it works. So let's just bring the color editor up the top so it's uh, easier to see. So the color editor is really the uh, the the king of of choosing a color and then deciding on the range of colors that you're going to edit and then making your edits as such. So the color editor has these uh, three tool tabs: basic, advanced, and uh, skin tone. Okay. So the basic tab is kind of the one you should just move right past uh, if you can as <laughs> such. I'm going to reset that. Um, the reason why the basic is there is because we have a free version of Capture One just for Sony users, which mm. is kind of cut down on the feature set, but same great image quality. Great if you just want to do some basic adjustments um, and you're not necessarily into doing loads and loads of stuff, it's a good start. So 
the capture on for Sony only has uh, the basic tap, for example. I see. But that's, I guess, the more Lightroom-esque thing where you can pick one of the color tones and make some basic adjustments to it. But if you can, you want to fast track straight to uh, advanced. Got it. Now, it looks a bit daunting at first because everything's sort of grayed out. I can't do anything. Sort of where do I start? Um, and the clue is here in the <laughs> color picker here. <laughs> so if you didn't spot that, then then you're in trouble uh, as such. But uh, as I said, the whole point of uh, the color editor in Capture One is that you first is define the color range that you want to edit, and then you go on to edit. So if I just pick on the outer ring, we're looking at a war plane fuselage if you hadn't guessed <laughs> as soon as i click we get this suggested color range pops up in our standard color wheel mm -hmm. here now unless you're some kind of color genius you probably don't really know what that equates to on the image itself so the next step is to click on uh, view selected color range like so and what happens is that everything dips to monochrome mm. that is not going to be affected okay uh, so right now we can see we're affecting here and we're affecting here. But what if I really only wanted to target that specific color tone? Now, it's quite tricky because they're obviously neighboring. Sure. Um, so how do I do that? So let's bring out the color editor so we can make it bigger. And this uh, boundary here, of course, is only a suggestion. We can grab any of the corner points. That's our picked color in the center. Mm -hmm. And then we can squeeze down. Actually, let's put it over here so we can see what's going on here. We can squeeze this down. And then as we get closer to our pick color, this is fading in its saturation slightly, but it's not quite there yet. So this leads us to our first slider, which is smoothness, which con uh, controls this kind of fuzzy roll off into the neighboring colors. Mm -hmm. So if I drag this down, then eventually at some point we get to just just that one Our color. color selection like so yeah and you can see it's no longer fuzzy it has a hard edge if we go too far it might be too much and as you see if we go back this way we pick up too much of the neighboring colors if we go back this way then we get a pretty nice very specific uh selection now the little uh uh no, what is it? It's not a square. It's a rectangular shape. Whatever the, the shape you call around the dot that you picked on, you were yep, you were yep. adjusting the edges of it, which is of course expanding or restricting the hue range that it is selecting yes. right there. So adding more yep. green, taking out green, and so on. The top Absolutely. to bottom is that saturation or is that a luminous saturation range? range. That's yeah, saturation. exactly. So if we went sort of like that, like that, so that's our picked color, and and if you just draw a straight line from the the outside to the center, that's that same hue, but along its saturation axis, right. if, if you like. So if we squeeze that up, so you can actually see that illustrates it quite yeah, nicely. Yeah, it does, yeah. There, like so. So then we can just fully squeeze that down. And then, okay, I'm happy with that. I can turn off view selected color range. Let's just move this back over here. And now we're free to manipulate you know, pretty obvious what's going to happen now. We can tweak the hue, we can desaturate it, we can make it more saturated, sure. and we can change the density like so. Got it. Uh, if you want, we can grab the picker again. Obviously, if we click here, that's going to give us our suggested range again. Probably don't need to touch it because there's no other similar hues in the image. Then we can play around with that. We could pick again. Again, we probably don't need to touch it. And, and each time you're no. clicking to pick a new color, I see it's adding a new uh, That's color right, a new in one the list here. there. It's not replacing the existing one. Absolutely. So it doesn't replace the existing one. You can have up to 30 different picks. Wow, okay. Which is generally enough for most things. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you can see your numerical uh, delta hue, delta saturation, delta density, the changes. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got your before and after here. Let's just make that a bit more dramatic so you can see. So that's what it looked like when you picked it. This is how it uh, looks okay. after your edits. And your numerical before and afters here uh, as well. And you can also turn them on and off. So you can see before and after like so. And if you want to preview the whole color edit, and this goes for any tool, uh, there's a little uh, um, backwards arrow, I guess is the best thing to, to describe it, mm -hmm. which is the reset button for the tool. But if we option click it, then it gives me a temporary before uh, okay. and after, like so. So any tool, option click, temporary. Okay, so that's how you disable just that one 
That's right, because the Lightroom users will be looking for a button, right. but there is no button. So it's an option click just to temporarily disable. Or if you want to disable one particular edit, mm -hmm. then you can do so. Might be, um, and, and you know, I'm. this is something I always do on these. I'm always throwing out <laughs> what I think, you, what you, should what I think you should do. <laughs> <laughs> but adding, because it, it, I can't imagine it would be that much work for the engineers, but adding that little checkbox to disable it would be very helpful because this is, having to option yep. click on it is completely non-intuitive. And anybody who's coming True. out this, you have to be told. Yeah, you, you have, have to be told. told. Yeah, um, yeah. So yeah. that would be a, that'd be a nice, simple little addition. Just that little checkbox in there, because people understand that checkbox on or yeah. off. That makes it easy. I mean, you got the checkboxes for the individual colors. Uh, yeah. Why not have it for the whole tool? It would just it would certainly make things easier for the newcomer. Yeah, and we do have uh, a help bubble, as you can see. So if you had stumbled across that. Mm -hmm. And read it. And read it. You would know. But I agree. <laughs> but I agree. Yeah. Um, but again, it's, it's I guess, one of those things you get used to not having the box. You know, it's pretty easy just to option click. Yeah, once you know it's there, it's fine. Box, so. but, once you know it's there, yeah, yeah. It's, it's that first hurdle. Um, so what else do we have down here? So let's just pick uh, the center bullseye again. There's a couple of small icons down here one of them you've probably already figured out from what you were saying which spans the whole saturation range so that's just an auto expansion of the whole range if you wish okay so if we tap that like so and the other one which is actually really handy and kind of not often used but uh equally useful is the invert mm. so it's very good if you think well if you look at your image and think um of of the image as such, I want to just protect one color and change everything else. So it could be for density, for example. So if I now invert that, then the only thing, and that was just a, a click of the button there, then we're going to change everything except my pick color. So if I change density now, for example, and we just do a big change, you know, everything is right. changing except for the pick color. So it can be kind of useful for all sorts of things, really. It's just good to know it's there. So this is the real trick behind those um, black and white photos of the girl holding the red rose. That's... Yes. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Here's how yeah. to do it. I never do it again. <laughs> yeah, because I guess if we did that, then we could desaturate pretty much everything. We might have to just squeeze that down a bit. But yeah, we could almost desaturate everything except... <laughs> yeah, you might be onto something there. Yeah, we probably just have to be very specific like so <laughs> nice <laughs> yes so that uh, certainly is is possible um if you hadn't spotted it before there's also a skin tone mm -hmm. tab which is i guess another strength of capture one in dealing with skin tones in all kinds of different ways uh, let's just pop that back there for a minute and grab skin tone adjust like so um this is a 100 megapixel file, so wow. that's due to the extreme zoom, for example. <laughs> Let's just zoom out a little bit. Off of a phase camera, I presume? Yeah, I think it's a IQ100. Let's check metadata. Yeah, IQ3100, yep. And Alex, who's the model, she's actually wearing some kind of eye color contact lens, which you can, you can see, the see, the, see the pattern on it. That's yeah. so bizarre. <laughs> How funny! Um, you guys are going to be—you guys Alex, are going to send one of these cameras skin. out after the show, right? That was the—that oh, was the of arrangement. Course, yeah, we'd, right. we get, every interviewer gets free camera, as, uh, as we say. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, what we have for um, skin tone? I've got super sensitive Wacom hand today. Uh, what we have for uh, skin tone uh, is pretty much the same controls, but but they're biased better for uh, working with skin tone. Uh, but the important one underneath is uh, uniformity. Mm -hmm. So that's a tool designed specifically to help uh, even out skin tones without having to go to Photoshop, uh, without having to do sort of uh, tricks in Photoshop, which I certainly don't know how to do. <laughs> uh, but we can use a pretty simple tool here just to make all of our skin tone uh, nice and even. Uh, if we just... I will zoom out a bit more. I mean, Alex's skin tone is pretty good, but you see there's slight variation around here. Let's, let's actually use one which is really uneven just to kind of test it a little bit more. So I remember I found an image earlier from today. I think this is the right one, this one here. So if we now zoom in, 
Oh yeah. Just going to re reset that back to standard. So we've got all kinds of skin tone going on, basically. Uh, you see there's warmer hue here, kind of gets, you know, a different tone just on, on the chest there mm -hmm. and, you know, everything. So if you wanted to do some kind of job to even that out, that's quite a big dark task sure. in uh, Photoshop, for example. So I wouldn't know how to do it, <laughs> don't know about you, but I, w I wouldn't know where to start. Uh, so what we can do is that we use the color editor to, to do that for us, to take the heavy lifting. Now, generally, this works better if we do it on a local adjustment because we can restrict the color edit to just the skin tone areas okay. um, because we might affect... Well, let's do it without a local adjustment. So, and then we we see the sort of disadvantage of not doing it with a local adjustment. So again, we've got our color picker. Slightly different this time. We're going to look on our subject and think, where is the best skin tone? Okay, so Again, you're you're a, looking for a good skin. What tone. you think is the best? Okay, so not you're not yeah. selecting what's not good. You want to specifically grab what you think is a good skin Absolutely. tone. Absolutely, okay. we want to specifically click on what we think is a good skin tone. Again, that's subjective, but let's just go kind of around there somewhere. So that gives us, again, the same thing as suggestion. The pick spot is the skin tone that I chose. Mm -hmm. uh, and then what the three sliders hope to do, uh, it might take you just two minutes to, or two seconds to think about it. The further we drag these to the right, basically everything in that color range is transformed to the pick point. So that's why we start with a good skin tone, because we want everything within that sort of range to get squeezed down into that picked point. Okay. So it's, it's a simple premise, but might just take a bit of sure. explaining. So the more we expand that out, the more colors or neighboring colors we're, we're going to affect. So let's just do quite a broad one so you can see what's going on. So if I drag hue across like so, you can see it's evens out all the hue of the skin tone. Let's just go back. Oh yeah, I really got rid right. of the red. Okay. Exactly, exactly. But it might affect something you don't want, like lips, the lips yeah. for example, or makeup or something like that. Up the so background we fix as that well. in a second. Okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And the background too. So saturation, we can do the same. And lightness is kind of Instagram filter territory, <laughs> where it will, uh, you know, completely ruin all the modeling you worked hard to do. So that's <laughs> one you've got to use with caution a bit more. It's good just to flatten it off if you need to, but it's not something you're going to be ramping okay. all the way to 100 points. So ideally, what we want to do is go to our local adjustments tool tab, which is this one here with a paintbrush, and we just want to mask the areas that we want to affect. So we can take a brush. Uh, if we right click, we get our various different brush tools. So I'm just going to do a really quick and quick and dirty mask let's go a bit bigger obviously you would probably spend a bit more time doing this but nobody wants to sit here and watch us draw masks uh, as a shortcut we can say fill mask just to save time oh that's handy that will fill it in okay. yeah very handy and we can invert and copy masks and do kinds of other stuff so now if i go to erase mask then what i do is i would just we would take out the eyes like so, and then if we just go a bit closer, once again, we would take out that, like so. But again, you probably want to spend a little bit more time uh, than, than myself. So now we've done a basic mask like that. So we just repeat the process, go to color editor, skin tone tab, let's press M to turn off the mask, grab our picker, so we think somewhere around there, I'll show you a cool trick in, in a minute. We can be really happy to expand this out because mm -hmm. we know we're only operating within the mask. And then we can say, fix the hue, saturation, and lightness. We want to be obviously careful with. Now, once we're at this point, if you want to tweak the color, you can just pick up that point and just move it. Oh, See? Very mm, nice. Wherever you want. Yeah. Okay. Avatar style or, or whatever. <laughs> so you can just pretty much tune the skin tone to what you want it to be. So if we just turn that layer off, so you can see before, after, like so. Okay. So just to make sure that we uh, we're understanding the interface here. So you have the same adjustments, the same tools under both a local and a, a general, I guess we call it, uh, adjustment control. So you've got where we started. Pretty much. Yeah, where was the, much. the tab that we started with? That was the, the three circles? So no, we were working in yeah. the color editor tab, which, sorry, the color tab, which has pretty much anything to do with color. 
So we've got the color editor, the color balance tool, black and white tool, mm -hmm. kind of ironic, but <laughs> that's that's where it is. Um, and in the local adjustments tool tab, we preload everything that works with a local adjustment. Okay. So not every single tool works with local sure. adjustments, but the useful ones. Work so now if you're in the regular color tool, the broad, uh, the regular color adjustments, if you're in there and you've made yep. a bunch of adjustments and then you decide, oh, I really need this to be localized. I can't, you know, I, just, I can't get what I'm trying to achieve here. I need to add a brush to it. Can you take that one and right. add a brush to it? Or do you create the mask and copy and paste the adjustment? Or how does, how do you make that transition? Uh, you know, what? I've never done that myself <laughs> uh, because I always, you know, start with a mask and then mm. go on, uh, go on to do it such. Cause I think generally when I'm doing skin tone stuff, I always start with a mask just out of habit more than anything. Sure. But I guess if you started doing your color edit, I mean, you can see how fast it was. So maybe it's not necessarily a, um, speed adjustment as such, but I guess you could, you could save a quick preset if you've done loads of work. Okay. So you could save that as a preset. Uh, and then once you've drawn your mask, you could just then pick up that preset once again, if you wanted to. Um, but I, th I think once you've got used to how the tool works, you could probably pretty much know when and when you're gonna want to use right. a mask or not, right. okay. I would think. Yeah. Alrighty. And then the two lines, we're looking at the skin tone circle now. Um, the two lines on the flanking in the left and right, it's, it appears to be a saturation and a luminance slider. How do those play Yeah, exactly. This? So again, if we wanted to, you know, tweak the luminance of the skin tone, we could do as well, but you see it's quite subtle. Okay. So it's just ramped a little bit less. And then this will also pick our, move our point in the same. So that will keep us the same hue, but it will desaturate or oh okay so this is the equivalent of just grabbing that dot and moving it around absolutely but it will keep it on the same axis right. as such like so so if you think well that's a nice skin tone but you know she's looking a bit pathetic or whatever we could just increase saturation but keeping the skin tone stable as such gotcha okay yeah without having to deviate you know accidentally deviate to right. you know, another skin tone as such right. okay yep. got it She's going to love us for, for doing this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but yeah, local adjustments, obviously we could spend an hour just talking about local adjustments, of but essentially it's, it's again, different to uh, Lightroom. I think it's good to make that distinction. I can't remember how Aperture works. You're the expert, so you, you can chip in. Uh, but with Lightroom, you're kind of, you're making a brush. So you're saying, I want this brush to do this much exposure, contrast, whatever, and then you draw over the image. It's sort of slightly different in Capture One. It's closer to Photoshop, I guess, that you make a layer. So I can just hit hit plus to make a new layer down here mm -hmm. uh, and then call that layer something like, you know, skin adjust. If I can type properly, skin adjust. And then once you've made the layer, you use various brush drawing tools to then put that on the image as such and then you can pick any combination of adjustments okay. to apply to that mask so it's closer to photoshop in that respect but different to how okay uh, lightroom so works it's essentially well, an so. adjustment layer with masking built into it um yes yeah. okay yeah exactly all right exactly and it's great for not only sort of adjustments as you saw there but also for local noise reduction which is very handy local sharpening which is very handy if we sure. just want to sharpen various elements of, of the image local high dynamic range as well uh, it's a really uh, powerful tool okay and now that we have uh, flow control mm. so uh, uh, flow at 100 basically means one pass of the brush will give us sure you know, max, maximum mask. If we have nice low flow, it means we can get a slow, steady build up of the mask. And that just means we can use it much better for things like dodging and burning, um, you know, controlled sure. mask changes rather than just laying on a huge adjustment. And this, of course, has full such. tablet support, pressure sensitive tablet. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I'm I'm scribbling on a, a Wacom uh, as we speak. Got it. So. So it's plug and play. We can use pen pressure if you wish mm -hmm. uh, to correlate to size, um, but that's not something I do. I just find it easy to right click sure. and just adjust like so. Or you can use shortcut keys, yeah. square bracket, same as Photoshop, all that sort of stuff. All right. All right. What should we look at now? Uh, let's look at... Well, I think I, I mentioned it briefly because it's another sort of useful or interesting thing to talk about 
um, how the sliders work, mm -hmm. which kind of sounds really dull, but <laughs> <laughs> bear with me, <laughs> um, because often there's this sort of stigma attached that you shouldn't use a slider called contrast, for example, because it has no intelligence behind right. it. Right, contrast just is some pretty kind generic. Of, you know, brutal punch of, of contrast. But uh, with, uh, with Capture One, it's actually somewhat easier to use um, than curves because you don't have to understand how curves work uh, and actually gives you a really nice compromise between two other methods. So I've got three different images here. I'm just, well, not three different. I'm just going to do Command R, which will just reset everything to default okay. as it came out of the camera. So let's look at the first one. I'm just going to make a bit of space and collapse some tools. So we're going to do the same trick. We're going to have another curve tool so let's add another curve tool that's just a right click on any tool tab to add okay. any tool where you want okay. just in case and we're going to throw in a bog standard basic rgb curve like so right. so i want to add some contrast let's do what i know mm -hmm. let's go to the the same image it's just a virtual copy and we're going to pick luma and we're going to do a similar thing like so and the images if we go back so that's the first you can see the curves changing hopefully i got roughly similar kind of shape to the two mm -hmm. the issue with rgb curves or not issue as such just how they actually behave uh, is that when you make some kind of curve change you cannot help but affect the color and right. the saturation as well right so saturation's gone up uh, the hue might have shifted a little bit, but we might not want that. So what a Luma curve does is it's pure contrast mm -hmm. as such. So we get contrast change, but we don't get any color shift at all. So even if I pull it really hard, then it's just completely neutral in terms of its color shift. But when you first start using luminosity curve, it kind of gets a bit of getting used to because somehow when you increase uh, saturation, uh, you expect uh, the color to kind of bump up a bit because if you think of a nice sunny day you look outside everything looks colorful and bright and fantastic and uh, and so on if it's a dull rainy gray day then everything looks flatter in color so when we increase contrast we do in some ways expect color to go up a little bit as such but the nice thing about using luminosity curves is that you're in control which kind of goes back to what capture one is about that uh, you're in control of what's going on, not the software making arbitrary changes for you. Mm -hmm. So with luminosity, I think, well, I want this much contrast and then I could go to saturation and then dial in the level of saturation that I wanted to have. Or if we go to our third image and we just do this with our contrast slider, what you actually end up with, uh, if we just bring up three images together, what you actually end up with is a compromise between the two. Mm -hmm. So that's RGB, that's luminosity, that's contrast slider. So this one sits somewhere in between the two. Yeah, which actually makes it a pretty nice tool to, yeah. to use. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, so you don't, you know, you don't have the the sort of issue of RGB curves screwing with your colors mm -hmm. as well. Uh, Luma, you might think, well, actually, I want to have a little bit of, you know, interesting yep. color boost as well. Whereas the contrast slider sort of does all that for you. So long story short, don't be afraid to use the contrast slider. It's, it's actually doing. It's actually quite uh, good. A pretty, pretty nice job. Nice. Exactly. Alrighty. Exactly. Yeah, and uh, also the same for. Uh, saturation does a very similar thing. Uh, let me just grab uh, this one, I think. Yep. So if we just grab a uh, saturation and pull that fully to the right, then everything gets saturated. Of course, a little bit too much, but nothing goes totally wild because mm -hmm. the saturation slider will leave colors alone that are already kind of on the upper end of the okay. saturation scale. So it, there's kind of some intelligence built into that. So if we grab the color picker and just pick our chilies, for example, you see it's right on the upper echelon of the saturation right. scale. So if I play with it now, you see it looks... You can, yeah, really kill it. Really make a big uh, mess of it. Whereas with the saturation slider, then Interesting. you can see... 
it, it has better control. It's quite good. So again, Lightroom users are probably looking for something called vibrancy, which is what it's uh, probably a little bit closer to as such, but has a good dose of uh, intelligence built into it. So the vibrancy tool in uh, in Lightroom and also going back to Aperture, the the big difference between it and saturation was the vibrancy so, uh, protected skin tones. It was yeah, it was yeah. largely about protecting that that very narrow hue range of skin tones. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so I'm not seeing a vibrancy tool in here. Is is that kind of built into saturation? So if you did this on yeah, a picture exactly. of a person. Yeah, exactly. Saturation also has that sort of in, inherent ability to uh, try and uh, protect uh, uh, the skin tones as well. Okay. And you've already seen with, you know, the contrast slider is pretty stable on color. So if you wanted to apply, you know, contrast to a portrait as such, let's just grab Alex for a second. Now, if you wanted to apply, you know, a bit more saturation as such and a bit more contrast, then you won't find that your skin tone mm. is shifting because of the way the contrast slider is right. is built in in the first place. Nice. So you shouldn't really run into those issues of, of nastiness with, with skin tone. Okay. So even if we push this up to 100, she's not turning into... You know, crazed sort of uh, umpa loompa as such. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Okay. Very nice. All right. Yeah. That's really so cool. So say, you know, don't be afraid to use a slider. Sure. There's nothing unprofessional about it. When some talented developer has spent an inordinate amount of time calculating how that should behave to give you know you good results. As right. Such. Absolutely. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's nice. And, and I think that does make it easier, a little bit more approachable when you know that you can just grab those simple sliders, grab it and get a really nice result yeah. and not have to think about what's uh, what's happening in the background. Absolutely. There's, there's no no shame in it as such. And it gives you, uh, gives you a good result. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah well, at the end of the day, that's what matters. And uh, you know, getting the result more Definitely. quickly, time is money and all that. So it's good. Yes. Super. Yes, absolutely. Speaking of time, how are we doing for, for oh, time? We, um, I think you got, was there one more thing you wanted to show? I'm going to look up the notes in here. Uh yeah, we had a little look at local adjustment, so hopefully that's kind of given everyone inspiration yeah. to, to look deeper. I think the last thing that's probably worth uh, talking about yeah, the process is recipes. a couple of things, actually. Yeah, processing, so exporting and processing. So that happens in the sort of second to, second to last tool tab, and there's a couple of uh, nice things which um, have been added here, for example. Uh, let's just grab... A process recipe here. So if you're not au fait with how process recipe works, these essentially avoid you having to enter a export dialog, choose a load of parameters, set that export going, and then have to go back to that export dialog to set a different export going. Because you might want to have a TIFF, you might want to have sure. a JPEG, uh, you might want to have your proofs with your watermark on, and you might just want to get all that processing at once. So process recipes prevent you from having to enter a dialog. It's a case of enabling it and getting started. So it's a, it, they're uh, presets, they're export presets, essentially. Export preset. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a good way of saying it, an export, uh, an export preset. Okay. Um, but what we can do before that is to kind of take out the guesswork of, of what happens in an export. So let's say for my uh, fictional website, I want to export this image, uh, which I think is from a, so it's 80 megapixel shot. So it's 10,000 pixels across. That's way too big for a website. So let's say I want to reduce that down to 1600 pixels as shown in this process uh, process recipe uh, i know that uh, when we you know make an image smaller or we make uh, an image larger it has some kind of negative effect uh, on the sharpening mm -hmm. but until i process it and have a look at it i've got no idea what that negative uh, effect is so if we look at a hundred percent for example uh, let's just scroll over here so looking at 100%, this looks nice and sharp and fantastic. But when I export it, what's going to happen to it? I don't know unless uh, we turn on this function here, which is a, if you like, an instant proof mm. function. So this will instantly process the image in the background, if you like, and show you what it's going to look like as an output. So if I turn this on based on the current process recipe, that's going to immediately proof to 1600 pixels across. Okay. So I can see exactly how it's going to look on my output. Okay. So I'm currently proofing my JPEG quality, which we'll come to in a minute, mm. the color profile. 
the scale so this is 1600 pixels across so if we just change this to 2000 200 2000 for example then it changes nice. straight away um, and if I want to if I go to my adjustments tab we can add some additional output sharpening so I'll just crank this up so you can see really, that yeah. it's happening that's really real nice time. so this will basically show me exactly how it's going to look at my output so if I think you know what I need a little bit more sharpening I'll just tweak it here we can also sharpen for print and uh, nice for going for retouch uh, if you've been say collaborating in the studio and then you've decided on how you want the image to look mm -hmm. the client's happy and so on but the retoucher says okay give me a 16-bit tiff but I don't want any sharpening right we can just say disable all and that will just kill all sharpening in capture one even if it's applied elsewhere in the application oh okay so it's not yeah. just so output then, sharpening that's turning it off everywhere yeah everywhere absolutely disabled everywhere so it's great in the studio or when you're working with a client with shots you've imported from memory card for example uh you can kind of pre-visualize how it's going to look but if the retoucher thinks you know what i'm going to do my own sharpening at the end of the retouching process disable all good to go and it also means then if you want a process for some other reason that you can dial in the amount of sharpening that that you want to to have gotcha. like so superb that's so really nice. i can also that's see really nice. sorry joseph carry on no i was just saying that's really nice that's a great mm -hmm. uh the great function to be able to see it and preview it so quickly like that while you're making the absolutely. changes that's really helpful absolutely and i can still go on if i wanted to adjust this i could still you know play with my sliders and it will proof at the same time and and everything so uh again that's that's kind of a good example of the the processing power of capture one you know using the graphics card using all processing cores and so on to, to, to give you that that fast experience okay. uh, on screen um, so with regards to the JPEG quality you know we could say well if I just put it on a hundred then I know I'm safe etc but we're going to end up with a pretty big file size sure as we can see at the bottom and that's unnecessary when it's only 2,000 pixels so we can also pre-visualize JPEG compression so at this size I could probably get away with quite you know, heavy compression and low quality because it's not really going to show at, you know, 2000 pixels across. Mm -hmm. So we can scale this nicely. We can visualize the profile. Uh, we've got a good idea of how sharp it's going to look. And then we'd be ready to, to hit the button and, uh, and process as such. Super. And you can, so you can enable multiple uh, process recipes at once. So you can just basically go click, yes. click, click to select a few different ones, hit process, and you're going to get three files. Yeah, so let's uh, let's actually do that, and we do something a bit bit cleverer. So we've got a bunch of images here. So we've got thirteen images. So let's let's just reset my recipe. What was that? Sixteen hundred, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Sixteen hundred, like so. Uh, so we've got that process recipe enabled, and let's say we want to have full size tiffs as well. So let's turn that on. Um, now the way this works, obviously, each process recipe has its own set of instructions which which we can we can change so you see when i choose a different recipe it mm -hmm. tells me exactly how it's going to be processed uh, output location tells me where the images are going to go so this is going to go in a folder called my exports if i hit the arrow that will take me to where that is mm -hmm. so let's delete some old legacy stuff that was in there so you guys can see what's happening oh select all so two process recipes now if i leave everything as it is now they're just going to all get dumped into that my exports folder as jpegs and tiffs together okay which might be okay but uh kind of might be inconvenient as well so what we can ask capture one to do is automatically create some subfolders for us and we can automatically create subfolders based on uh image metadata basically, or other metadata that, that we have access to. So it could be today's date, for example. Uh, it could be the camera serial number. Uh, it could be the aperture that it was captured at. Uh, it could be the star rating on the image uh, and so on. Uh, but we're going to use uh, what we call a token, a capture one token, which will define the process recipe. So if I uh, start typing, I know the name of the token is called recipe name. So if I pick that token like so, 
then it pops up here. If you don't know the name of tokens, you can click on this box and it will give you a full list of tokens, most of which you will probably never use. <laughs> but trust me, there's someone in the world who, who finds all of them extremely uh, useful. So we're just going to do a recipe name like so. Okay. So what we're going to end up with is a folder in my exports based on the recipe name. So we've got 13 images, 13 JPEGs, 13 TIFFs. Let's say uh, process. And we go to our export folder. So we've got full size TIFF, those popping in nicely, mm. JPEG, sRGB, optimized for web. So they're basically taking the same name that we have yep. in the process recipe. That's like great. So. Very handy. I like that a lot. Yeah, very handy. Very handy. And we can actually build on from that. So if we did another one, you're not restricted to one token. So let's say after the recipe, we want to divide it up by um, star rating. So you see these have got various different star ratings. Could be color tags. So let's do a, uh, whoops, excuse me. Let's do a forward slash mm. and choose another token, which is rating. Wow. Like so. So now we're going to get folder by recipe name and individual folders based on star rating. Oh, very cool. So let's just let's just delete those out of there and set the process recipe going again. Oh, helps if I select them <laughs> and say process <laughs> schoolboy error. So now we've got full size TIFF. That's all the four stars. There's wow. all the fours. There's all the five stars. That's superb. And then gradually you'll see three star pop up in a minute when we get to it that's great and back it's funny back in the days of, of uh, aperture this is something that aperture didn't yeah. do and i had actually i commissioned someone to write a apple script that really? did it certainly couldn't <laughs> go deep like this but it would at least create an export folder with the name of the preset and you could select multiple right, right. presets so uh, we had to do that all through apple scripting to get it and, uh, and this is very nice. nice to see that built in that is very very useful <laughs> indeed that's I mean, great if you want to go sort of one more level pro actually each process recipe can also have an individual location mm. so as well as either saying just go to the output location so you see these process recipes we just use say look at what capture one's got in the output location that's your destination but if we want to i have one here or this is a, a kind of example what we could do for instagram because instagram is annoying of course we can't post from our computers we have to do it from our phone uh, so this instagram recipe saves to dropbox in a subfolder of today's date mm -hmm. So that it goes to Dropbox, I then open up my phone, got it, um, it download is. it, uh, and I can see it's in a folder for today's date, so I know I can access it straight away or where to look. Download that to my phone and then upload to Instagram, and it also helpfully crops to sure. 2048 by 2048 as well. Can you? So uh, we can run all these process recipes. They could be going to the same location, or they could be going to. 10 different locations, mm -hmm. for example. Can uh, the, you uh, can you push to an FTP? Can you FTP from here? Yeah, as, as well, as long as um, the system can see it, then you can go anywhere. It's just a case of selecting folder. Okay, so if you mount the so, FTP drive, but it doesn't have a built-in FTP yes, server. Doesn't have a built-in FTP, okay. but if you mount the drive and, and the system can see it, sure. then it's just a case of saying select yeah, folder and picking it up like so. Yep. So Google Drive, Dropbox, you know, OneDrive, uh, probably Amazon services, sure. you know, anything that you can access, you could upload to here. So I've seen people use this for client sharing. So if they're on a shoot and the client wants to see stuff right, right away, they just have a process recipe enabled, mm -hmm. go into the client Dropbox. And then at any point, remember, we're not modular. So even if I'm over here somewhere and say, oop, wrong shortcut key my mistake even if we're just in any old tool tab perhaps we're in a totally you know different collection for example if i press uh, command d at any point uh, then basically it's going to trigger off whatever process uh, uh, recipes are running okay so if i said command d now on my laptop then it would simply start these process mm, okay. recipes running very good so you don't have to be in this tab you know any shortcut will access mm. uh, the 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 Sure. Process without having to be in that tab. Very good. Go back to the the thumbnails yeah. view that we were in uh, a moment ago. There's 
<laughs> question oh, yeah. I had for you about oh, this. That image is just fine, actually. Back up to the top. So I'm seeing this looks like a crop overlay. What What is it that we're looking at here? It's showing me the way the image is cropped, but I'm seeing the full thumbnail in the browser? Yes. So you see the full thumbnail, and then the uh, crop is is how the actual image is cropped. Interesting. Like so. Okay. Yep. So if I press C on my keyboard to get to the crop tool, this is, again, a bit different to Lightroom, then we see the full scope mm -hmm. and this is something which uh, often Lightroom users get to get frustrated with they they put a crop uh, on the screen let me just take that off my Instagram props uh, so they put a crop on the screen and then they press enter and you, you know tap, right. tap, tap. nothing's happening nothing's happening you don't have to apply a crop in capture one it's applied as soon as you've drawn it it's applied okay when I move away from the crop cursor tool I see then we see the crop view like okay so. Interesting. It's just a different way of doing it. Yeah. That's all. Yep. All right. So if, if I press C for crop, V for pointer, then... And then back in the thumbnails view, and I'll ask because I'm sure somebody else will, can you disable that so in the thumbnails I see the cropped image instead of seeing the whole image with the shadow? No. Okay. You can't. Okay. You can't. You can change the density of that if you want that darker or lighter or whatever. Okay. So, so if you want to just black that out, you could if you wanted okay. to. Okay. All right. Yeah. Very good. Super. There we go. Well, I think... Uh, I think we've seen quite a bit here. This is quite, uh, yeah. it's a great app. I mean, obviously, it's got the legacy. It's got the history. Everybody knows this is a very sure, powerful, sure. very high quality app. And and it mm -hmm. seems to be one of those things where the people who use it, it's, it's for them, it's all about the image quality. The raw processing yes. that they get out of Capture One versus Lightroom or anything else, that's, that's mainly the reason they do it is because they think the images look better, feel that their images look better. Which yeah, and, and I think... Um, the the reason behind that is one the color profiling uh and two there is kind of no such thing as a as a, a default for every single camera and every single iso so for the color profiling we don't rely on just getting a raw file and playing around with the raw file and saying it's now supported in in capture one uh, so we need the camera in our hands we shoot about 700 images for each camera that we support uh, obviously there is some kind of shoot a color target, run it through a system to get the start point. But from then on, it's very much hand tuned color profile to get the best all round color profile for all kinds of photographic uh, situations. So we don't just slap up a target, capture it and get the computer to, to spit out the ICC profile. It's very much that handcrafted process. And in terms of noise reduction, even when you look at the uh, noise reduction tool itself, so the noise reduction tool, whether we pick, you know, a, a phase one image or a Nikon image, it always says 50, 50, 50, but depending on the uh, ISO mm -hmm. and depending on the camera itself, there's different noise reduction going on under the hood. Okay. So our goal is really to give you good color out the box, good noise reduction out the box, also good sharpening out the box because we vary the sharpening defaults camera to camera too. So that really... What you should be doing from your first step in Capture One is not having to improve on the default color, improve on the default noise reduction, right. improve on the default sharpening. We've kind of optimized that. You're getting started on the creative process, which is what you should be doing, not fixing stuff. Yeah, for basically. sure. Okay. Yeah. Very good. And and I think Capture One, if we go back, say, a couple of versions, people picked it for image quality alone but now what we're starting to see is people coming for uh, performance because you know browsing between uh, image to image is you know e extremely quick mm -hmm. and even if i zoom into say 100 percent, so just to check what camera this is uh, i think this is a what have we got uh, this is a 60 megapixel camera so still fairly hefty on megapixels with grain applied and all kinds of other mm -hmm. adjustments if we go to the previous image and back and forth, you see, I don't sure. have any lag whatsoever in changing that because we, we pre-cache a lot of data sure. in the background as Capture One is working so that it's nice and speedy if I want to browse back and forth, gotcha. you know, just check in for focus in, in different things. Yep. So we don't get sort of virtually zero lag when we're going through different images like so. So a lot of people are coming to us now for not only image quality, but for performance and workflow stuff like you saw with the process recipes. Right. It's one of those things that yeah. seems to be universal across any asset management tool is they start off nice and snappy when you've got only a couple hundred images in there. But as you get yep. into the tens or even hundreds of thousands, that things do tend to slow down quite a bit. 
What's yep. what would be your response to that with Capture One? Is are you going to see a noticeable slowdown as you increase your catalog size? Is there a, a maximum size or number of images that you really want to have in a single catalog, or does it not matter? Sure, sure. I think there is no theoretical upper limit so you could put 10 million images in a catalog if you wanted to but when you first open a catalog it has to do some you know checking process counting various other things go on so what you will see with larger catalogs is that is that they might take longer to open okay just to give you a benchmark i think my one of my catalogs has got just about 19,000 images in it and that takes about six to ten seconds to open and be ready as such okay. but it's it's kind of very much system dependent as well like if you put your catalog database on an old slow external nas drive it's going to take forever to to open and, and do operations but if you have your catalog database on an internal ssd it's you know fast 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 even if the raw files are on some okay. you know older external hard drive mm -hmm. so it's often about making good choices about optimizing uh, where the catalog uh, should be stored Got and it. such um, but we've made quite a few changes to the catalog if anyone has been using say capture on seven or eight or whatever throughout the iterations the catalog database has been you know optimized and improved so i'd say if you're worried about you know experiences in the past try capture on 10 free trial got nothing to lose right really good enough good yep. very good all right um uh, mobile. I mean, let's talk about mobile for a moment. Is there any kind of mobile sure. workflow integration for those with iPads, iPhones, and so on that want to somehow connect in through Capture One? Yes and no. We've got, uh, if I just add, let's just add the Capture, 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 Capture tool tab. Sorry, add tool tab. Like so. So we have obviously this tool tab all about tethered shooting, controlling the camera, adjusting camera settings, running live view, all that kind of stuff. And there's also Capture Pilot, which is the the closest thing we have to uh, mobile apps. Uh, so that basically gives you a second way to monitor uh, a shoot. It's not cloud related or anything like that. But if you imagine you're shooting tethered in the studio and you've got two or three people who want to look at what's going on in the shoot but you don't want them crowding around your monitor you know getting in your way poking fingers at the screen and so on then what capture pilot does is give you a secondary viewing on a iphone ipad or any other web device which allows people to view the shoot add color tags add star ratings and so on and you can actually use it to control and shoot the camera as well mm. but the stipulation is that the capture pilot um device your iphone ipad etc has to be on the same network that I see. capture one does i see um so it's not like a cloud-based system it's a, a collaboration system okay it's probably the best way to describe it okay already okay very good i don't think there's anything right. else i want to hit on right now i think uh We've done justice. I mean, obviously, there's still a huge amount of things we could be talking about. Yes. But, um, <laughs> yes. If you've got another three hours, then. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, maybe we'll have you on for a part two at some point. We can get into um, yeah, we can get into specifics, the, into yeah. the weeds a little bit more. Right on. Well, let's sure. uh, let's just move on with this particular podcast, though, and move on to the next step, which is the okay. guest app pick. This is the part of the show where we ask uh -huh. you, our guest, to name your favorite photography-related app on any platform. It can be on Mac or Windows, iOS or Android. Okay. Doesn't matter. What is your favorite photo-related app that the audience... And it can't be made by your company. That's the caveat. Okay, damn it. Damn. <laughs> Ooh, damn. Well, I uh, almost had it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought uh, thought hard about this because I don't actually use a, a lot of... Um, of photo apps obviously i use capture one i use photoshop to to some extent but i'm not a big photoshop user i'm not a big skilled photoshop user and so on obviously uh, i use you know the odd mobile app but nothing to any real great extent except uh which i didn't kind of really realize how much i used it was google photos okay uh one uh because it's great just for backup on when you're just shooting stuff on your iPhone, etc. And secondly, I don't think it's on this account, but I also have a, a Google Photos process recipe because mm. um, just as a, a secondary sort of backup or just, um, and I'll tell you why, I, uh, the real kind of reason, secret reason why I do this uh, is um, that everything I shoot, I also export out to Google Photos periodically just with the recipe. So it goes to an external hard drive, which the desktop Google Photos app is watching and then uploads all of that to Google Photos. And the reason why I started doing that is because I'm a, a terrible, lazy 
keyworder, even though we have a great keyword tool in Capture One and a keyword library tool in Capture One, I never seem to have got round to, to doing sure. those things. So with all of my stuff on Google Photos, if I need to find a picture of whatever, lake, mountains, you name it, I just go into Google Photos, use their, um, I guess, artificial intelligence search. And it does a pretty good job of finding various different images. Then I just go back and dig it out of Capture One. So it's That's the cool. lazy man's way of keywording, uh, I guess. But I have to take my hat off to them. It's a, it's a really neat little app. It means if the entire house burns down or whatever, I've got some kind of backup online of right. everything. Uh, I can search it pretty quickly. Uh, it's identified faces very quickly. It's, uh, it's great. Yeah. And, you know, it's free. So you can't argue with that. Really. Right. There you go. <laughs> There you go. Yep. Super. Well, good. That's a uh, that's a good choice. And I, I love the use case of how you're using it. That's uh, yeah. That's very cool. Because yeah, I agree. Keywording the is just lazy. Lazy man's keywording. Yeah. Yeah. Well, eventually, <laughs> uh, and we're starting to see it with the Photos app, Photos by mm. uh, from Mac OS or in Mac OS. Yes. Um, that it does yep. do that same kind of AI, but it is on the desktop, and it's not adding the keywords. It doesn't actually add them into it. But you go and you search no. for lake, mountain, sunset, whatever, and it actually it does. Um, exactly. It's incredible. It, it's it it is it's totally incredible and I obviously would recommend that people follow my lazy example but you know it's great that if uh, someone asked me just friends or have you got a picture of that that time right. we went there or whatever you know within seconds it's I've picked it up and you can share it and yeah yeah it's great yeah so can't fold it really very good well that's uh, next yeah. level for capture one itself is to get that kind of artificial yeah, intelligence built into it so <laughs> yeah. it can start to <laughs> this appears to be an image of a girl on a lake in the mountain and taken to this place and just add the keywords It'd be fantastic yep very good <laughs> that would be nice all righty yeah. well yeah. where can people go to learn more about capture one Okay, we have a few choices. Uh, we have a, a, a great blog, which is blog.phase1.com. So that's called our Image Quality Professor blog. And uh, we have guest writers. We have Niels, who's kind of our, our color slash profiling guru who's been at Capture One almost, well, I think since the start, one of the founding partners. So he writes on there too, guest photographers, myself, other staff, great resource. Um, very recently, we had one all about switching from Lightroom, for example. So it's all kinds of help articles like that. Uh, we have Capture One Pro on YouTube, our own YouTube channel, which we've just started. We sort of split that away from phase one because phase one, of course, is all you know, hardware, cameras, sure. photographer stories, whereas Capture One, it's kind of different. We need to have educational content uh, and so on, mostly as such. So now it's easier to find on Capture One's YouTube channel. We have our Facebook page, which is stories uh, and inspiration and so on, and also our Capture One Instagram uh, channel as well. Excellent. And also the help site uh, too. So there's all kinds of different ways right. we can well, help people get started as well. Super. We'll make sure we get all those links into the show notes so people can Great. easily find Great. and click on all of those. Fantastic. Yes. Well, thank you. <laughs> awesome. Sounds good. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. This is great. Uh, You're it's, welcome. It's Obviously, it's a great app. Um, I've barely scratched the surface of it, and I certainly learned a mm -hmm. few things here today that I didn't know about. So that's very good for uh, – very good for me. So thank you. Always nice to see. Yeah. It. And I think I'm going to I'm going to have to give it more of a try. Like I said, I have doing what I do, obviously, with between the education side mm. and actually shooting. At some point, you just got to make a decision on what you're going to do. And definitely. And definitely. Um, and so I, you know, like many others, ended up using Lightroom for the most part. And it's it's far from perfect. You know, nothing's perfect, of course. Um, um, but it's no, it has no. its it has its frustrating points and it has its advantages. But I do need to mm -hmm. give Capture One a, a good shake and really really truly actually use it and not just play around with it, but stick a few jobs in there and start processing them and just accept that it's going to take a little longer to get started. Um, that's right. I get to yeah. learn it, and I think that's a good way to do it. If you actually force yourself to do a job in it, yeah. then you kind of, you, you discover all the things that you need to make that job a success and, and to make it go smoother. And then, you know, practice makes perfect. Yeah. The more you use it, the faster you get better at it. None of us are that great at going from one software to another because each software is, is very unique. So you do have to spend, you know, a, a small amount of time just kind of right. getting your head around how, how an application yeah, works. For sure. For sure. Yeah. And we have a couple of very dedicated users on the photoapp.expert site that absolutely love Capture great. One and they're, they're always um, they're always flying the flag for you guys and, and trying to get more Fantastic. people to give it a try. So, <laughs> yeah, glad to hear. Yeah, it. absolutely, absolutely. Well, we send them a free camera as well. Oh, yeah. Super, man. free cameras all around. Yeah, don't you quote get me on a that. Camera, yeah. You get a camera. <laughs> what, what is the Wouldn't the highest nice? end 
Um, was it 100 megapixel? Is that the, the top? Yeah, of- IQ3 100 on the XF system. IQ3. Yep. And what, what, is, what does that set you back for a, a body and a, and a lens? Because you can't use you it. You know what? I, I wouldn't like to say because there's so many different options because we have the IQ3 platform. There's the IQ1 platform, which is still 100 megapixel, but at a lower cost. It doesn't have Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi for example, but it's still uh, the same image quality mm. as such and also depends on the lenses you sure. buy and all the other accessories. So I wouldn't like to throw it out there. Plus, there's pre-owned as well. Mm. So if you want to spend you know, under $10,000 or whatever, then you can easily pick up pre-owned stuff as well. It doesn't have to be brand new so if you see your phase one partner they will gladly talk about all the options for you very good very good well it's a hell of a thing shooting medium format i've only done it a few times Definitely. myself and uh, it's it's a whole different yeah. ball game it really is so absolutely it's a wonderful thing to absolutely. shoot absolutely right on well thanks again for coming on that does bring us to the end of the show it's another uh, end of another episode of the app show thanks for coming <laughs> on here i'm of course your host photo joseph you can find me online at photo joseph pretty much anywhere or on our website photoapps.expert of course and uh i guess that's about it so with that it's time to put your lens cap back on and go edit some photos <laughs>